hello ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have had a couple of weeks. We're saying welcome back to a couple of friends who have been off of off of live stream for a little bit. So I've been really enjoying our conversations in the chat. Um, I'm losing my voice, but only an itty bitty bit. So hopefully uh, we'll still be able to have a great time sketching and all of that. Um, I had originally grabbed a little back swimmer because he's kind of colorful. I couldn't remember if we'd sketched him before, but um, Deb, Deb mentioned that we should do a pollinator, so I'm going to go and grab a pollinator real quick, and I'll be right back. a couple of minutes there. I was looking through my specimens trying to find pollinators that we hadn't sketched before and I'm not sure if we've done these guys so I kind of wanted to bring two just to see how you felt about them. <coughs> um, so I have, well we can probably do it under the microscope. So I have a, uh, a little sweat bee here. He's a really super cute metallic green and blue head and thorax with the stripy abdomen. He's adorable. He's one of our native, um, he's one of our ste um, native stem nesting bees. One of those bees that are sleeping right now in little grass stalks. Um, and then we have a flower fly or a surfid. So this is a fly that does visit flowers and does pollinate, but he also mimics a bee. So um, I guess my question is how many of us have sketched these two um, <coughs> and which one we want to do? So we have either the sweat bee or the flower fly. What do we think? Um, there's possible that I can find, it is possible that I will find other specimens too. If there was another specimen that we wanted to, to sketch, I was trying to think of pollinators that we haven't done yet. We could just pull, I could go into my collection and find a butterfly we haven't done. Flower fly sounds a little more interesting, and we haven't done a dip drain in a while. That's true. All right, so we're going to do the flower fly. See, I sketched. 
much four times a week now, so admittedly I have lost track of which ones we've done and which ones we haven't done. Which is why every now and again you'll see repeats on this channel, but I figure as long as the people are different and we're having different conversations that it's kind of like doing it. It's, it's, uh, it's fine that we do them a second time. So let me go ahead and get my specimen into the center of my thingamajig. Aha! I like viewing, um, I like viewing flies from a dorsal point of view. I know, um, it's a little easier, I know it's a little easier to do legs and stuff if we're looking at them laterally, but I'm a fan of this direction. Susan says she's always going to be in favor of a butterfly. That's fun. I, um, I will have to collect more butterflies this spring and summer. I honestly don't have very many butterflies in my collection. I just haven't gone about collecting them. I love watching them fly around, and I haven't really chased after them too much. Um, so we're looking at a flower fly here, and when we are looking at flower flies, especially out there, um, especially out there that are kind of hovering around the, uh, around the flowers. Um, they, the big characteristic that will help you determine whether it's a fly or whether it's a bee or a wasp is the antenna. So flower flies here, they have kind of these little short stubby antenna and wasps and bees are generally going to have longer um, longer straight antenna or longer elbowed antenna. And when we get a close-up look at uh, the flower fly's head, we're going to be able to see that they have actually very unique antenna and flies, um, many flies have this type of antenna, but it's unique to the, just that order. So let's go ahead and um, get into this. So uh, we're going to keep make sure that flower and fly are two separate words because this is a true fly. All right. Um, it is in the order Diptera. Uh, so the scientific name for the order of this family is Diptera. That means two wings. So Dipterans are actually the only insect on the entire planet other than strepsipterans, <laughs> they have two wings. Um, and flies, when you consider, when you consider flies versus strepsiptera, the other insect that only has two wings, flies have their front wings and are missing their hind wings. Strepsipterans have their hind wings but are missing their fore wings. All right, so they are very easy to tell apart if you notice that, um, they are very easy to tell apart if you notice that they have two wings. You can just kind of see where those wings are. So that's where you're at with the order. Now, um, we call them, I always call them flower flies. You see them around flowers. That is a common name that makes sense to me personally. There is another common name that is regularly used. And so sometimes people go, wait a minute, aren't those hoverflies? Yes, it's a com it's another common name for the exact same family. So flower flies and hoverflies are generally considered the same, but we always make sure that there's a space between the words. And I think even Wikipedia right now has hoverflies as one word. Not, uh, not, not being good. All right, so the scientific name for their family is, oh, yeah, that's how you spell it. It didn't look right for a minute, but that is how you spell it. They are called surfids, or they're in the family surfidae. Um, now, for the exact genus and species on this specimen, I'm not exactly sure. It was collected in New Boston. Oh, look at that. So this is one of my older specimens in my collection. This was collected in New Boston, which is my hometown back in Michigan. And it was collected in 2010. So this specimen, this little hoverfly over here is 13 years old. So cute. All right. So 
so I'm going to just start off by giving us this, uh, giving us a light sketch of the specimen. I do want to make sure that we, um, that we measure our specimen from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen. I am not going to be taking into consideration those antenna here. So I'm starting around here and I'm going to come down from the front of the head all the way to the back of the abdomen. Oh, and I had my measurement in inches for my for my kiddos. So let me switch this over to centimeters. Aha! Uh -huh. So our specimen is 1.21 centimeters long. And while we're in here, so that's the total measurement is 1.21. I might as well give us, let's see, the head is 0.21. The thorax is 0.4, and the abdomen looks like 0.6-ish, to give you an idea. So it looks like the, the length of the head and the thorax is equivalent to the lake of to the length of the abdomen. And I think that some of us really appreciate having some of those numbers for our ratios. So that might be able to help you out. It is looking good for its age. So it's a true flower that associates with flies. That's funny. It's a true fly that associates with flowers. It's a flower type of fly, not a fly flower. Oh, right. <coughs> All right, so we have this head up here, and um, the head is going to be very D-shaped. So um, I'm going to start my sketch with kind of it staying pretty flat on the bottom, but then when we zoom in, we're going to notice that it's kind of arched up a little bit. But this just gives me, you know, a nice, uh, like a, a starter to start my sketch on. So I'm going to start at the bottom of my head, and then I'm going to wrap it around to just give myself kind of a D shape. I am also going to, let's see, we want it to get wider before it gets more narrow. We want it to actually come out a little bit before it wraps around. And I'm going to start my head just a little bit smaller so that I have the ability to fit the wings in. More like that. All right, so that's going to help me out. Um, so I'm just starting off with my head like this. I'm going to give myself this flat bottom here, kind of round it off around the center. Now, you may notice that the antenna are kind of on a, on a branch or on, a, on like almost a pedestal on the top of his head. And we are going to get there. I just find that it is... I just find that it is easier to sketch all of those pieces around the antenna. It's easier once we've zoomed in a little bit. And we want to make sure that we're getting kind of the overall size of all of the body parts before we zoom in. So that's what we're doing. So we've got this, um, we've got this head shape that's going to get fixed when we zoom in. Um, and we know that that one's about 0.2. Um, our thoracic region is going to be very boxy up here at the top, so let's see. <laughs> All right, our, um, our thoracic region comes down in this rectangle, but it doesn't create an entire square. So what I'm going to do is we're going to get out to be about here, and then we're going to bring the thorax in a little bit. This is where the wings are connected. All right, so what you're doing here is you're creating a little bit of space for these wings to come out on either side. And then I'm going to just close it over, and then you get this extra little segment right here. And you're going to laugh, but this extra little segment, dude, this is the scutellum. So in beetles, you find the scutellum right between the elytra. It's that little triangle. Well, in flies, they have a scutellum too, and it's generally this little segment in between the wings. 
which is funny because that's what it is on a beetle also. All right, so we've got the head and the thorax, and the abdomen is going to be approximately the same length. So if you just go ahead and give it a measure and bring it on down, a lot of times I'll just give myself a bottom line to say, all right, it's going down to right around here. The abdomen actually connects underneath the scutellum, so you can almost start your abdomen back here in the scutellum. If the abdomen was connected to the bottom of the thorax, the scutellum kind of overlaps it a little bit on the top. Um, all right, so we've got this abdomen coming out from the edges. The first and the second segments of the abdomen are generally pretty parallel on either side. And then once you get past that, it starts to narrow strongly until you get to the bottom. This is why a lot of people feel like these guys, they look like bees because they look like they could even have a stinger, right? Um, but they don't have a stinger and they're super duper nice and they're helping our pollinators. So we don't have to worry about them at all and you know what i think next week we will do a butterfly we'll do the sulfur because it's one of the first butterflies you see in the spring all uh, right now i am gonna go ahead and get our wings situated at least get an outline of the wings you'll notice the wings go past the length of the abdomen and a lot of times when this fly is holding its wings out watch this they make almost a triangle so if you take this edge here and you come out and you take this edge here and you come out kind of like you were making I don't know, an equilateral triangle with 60 degree edges. These edges, I'm going to take this one out just a little bit. It's kind of awesome. If you imagined these lines to meet up at the center, this is likely going to be a, a perfect triangle here. So you've got these coming out on the edges, and then where they, they come out evenly... All right, and then they're going to angle back in towards back in towards the abdomen like this. And then I believe we're going to have to look at it a little bit, but it comes over the abdomen before coming back out. So that's going to give us an overall idea of what the wings are going to be looking like. And then when we zoom in, I get to talk to you about all the different wing veins. In fact, there's one very important vein with flower flies that helps us identify this family, that helps us identify this fly all the way to family. The ratios are helpful to the sketch. Good. So the cover bun is the scutellum. Yeah, exactly. The cover bun is the scutellum. I love it. Susan, you're going to uh, find some morning cloaks. That's going to be awesome. Let's look at a fly head. So I want to look at it from above first and then, excuse me, I want to look at it from above first and then we're going to look at it from a lateral point of view to really focus in on those antenna because um, they're a little bit trickier to focus on, especially when we're looking at the eyes. They're just at different focus levels. All right, so now that we are all zoomed in, it's going to be a little bit easier for us to get all of these, to get these lines um, figured out, but I do have this situated. So we have a straight line that's coming across here, and what I want to do is I want to put an arch on it because um, this head doesn't go straight across. It's more... It's more like that. And so from here, the edges of our head come out in the direction I, I had gone. So that was all right. And then uh, we're going to go, uh, we're going to come up just a little bit before 
we come back in. So I want there to be this kind of angle here where the eyes are. And then as we're coming in, I just want to finish the eyes. I'm not going to go kind of past those. So what I'm doing here, we have the eyes that come out, and then they're going to be coming back towards the center of the head. All right, and then after they all, they come back to almost the center of the head here, they're going to come all the way down along your edge, but they're not going to touch. So you see the eyes don't come all the way back. So we're going to just kind of wrap that bottom line, and you're going to make them make it follow this to kind of make it look 3D. And make sure that your eyes are symmetrical, right, because insects... Their left eyes and their right eyes should be mostly the same. So as long as that, um, that widest point is closer to the top, I like my left eye better than my right eye. So if you were following my sketch, um, I would base it off of the left eye. Something along those lines. Now, uh, we do have Ocelli. We do have Ocelli. These are little, small, simple eyes, and they're in the center of the head. This little guy, that little guy, and that little guy, those are all little Ocelli. And they don't have the ability to see colors. All right. They mostly are, like, looking through saran wrap. They can see shadows, light and dark. They can tell if something is flown over them. They can tell if a predator is coming, but they cannot see color, and they have a very difficult time seeing, sh like, very detailed shapes. They can tell chunks of light and dark, but they can't really see shapes. All right, now from in between the eyes, I'm just going to go ahead and erase this light line here because um, the head doesn't go straight across. It's going to come up from this point and create this little plateau for the, uh, for the antenna. And there is a little suture right here in between those, so I like to just go ahead and give that. Is anybody else loving the... <laughs> texture of the compound eyes. The compound eyes are always awesome. Let me go ahead and just zoom it in for you. It makes me a little sad when the insects are covered in like dust and debris and stuff, but it's really difficult to clean them off. You can use like a little paintbrush, but you also worry that you're going to kind of knock off or, or damage the specimen too. You don't want to knock off hairs or the antenna because you're trying to, to clean dirt, dirt off. Now I'm going to turn our specimen sideways so that we can see the antenna. So flies have really funky antenna. Um, sometimes people will call them sausage-shaped antenna. Um, that's what I would consider a common name for them. They kind of are large. These guys are more rounded, so I don't see the sausage shape in these ones in particular. But a lot of times they look like big sausages that are hanging off their face. They're kind of like wide and um, and short. And these are, you can kind of see they're almost like one segment. Now, on fly antenna, I'm not sure exactly like the uh, scape pedicel flagellum type thing. They're kind of their own type of antenna. Um, so they're sausage shaped, but the scientific name is what we call a wristate antenna. All right, they've got these kind of, they, what you're seeing are two segments. There is a base segment that would be right around here. It's this kind of rectangular segment, and it does kind of come off of that st stem. So if we come right here, you've got one little kind of rectangular segment here, and then there is a second segment that's very bulbous.
And these are what we call a wrist state antenna. Now, funny enough, there's a reason for that. You see this hair here. It's a very strong hair coming off of the antenna. Um, all a wrist state antenna have that little hair. Some of them are really big and fluffy. Like I have a green bottle fly sitting next to me that the hair on the wrist eight antenna looks like this really big feather. It's really beautiful. This one is more like one straight, one stray hair, but that hair, it has a name. This hair right here is what we call the Arista. So if you take, uh, if you take this little hair and put them here and there, that's where the Aristate antenna get their name from. They get their name from that little hair on it. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little about how scientists know what different eyes can see? How do scientists know if animals can see in color or not, for example? Yes, I can talk about that. So, um, there are a variety of different ways that you can kind of tell how insects are seeing. Um, and I've read a couple of different papers for different methods. So I'm going to go over a couple, but I'm not sure what they've used for like this fly in particular, for instance. So, um, uh, with, I, I read a, I went to a talk about dragonfly vision and how many colors that they can see. And their vision is really unique in the way, because dragonflies are also very colorful, so they have very, um, they have this like unique ability to see more colors than we can see. And the way that they know which colors dragonflies can see and they can't see is actually by going in and like dissecting little bits of the eyes. So, um, we're looking at what we call compound eyes, and inside of compound eyes, there are things called omatidia, and singular, they are, it is an omatidium, all right? So, um, the omatidia are all of the individual lenses within the compound eye, and each omatidia can actually have, like, slightly different, um, like slightly different characteristics. They essentially have, you're going almost a little past where my knowledge is, but I'll explain it to you how I was kind of explained it. It's like you have different receptors in your eyes and we can actually kind of dissect the eyes and see which color receptors they have and they don't have. So we can kind of see which colors just by, just by the receptors, which colors they should and should not be able to see. Um, I don't know how that translates to the brain. Um, the other way is with water tigers. Water tigers are an aquatic invertebrate that, um, they have very, very thin eyes. Like they, they, the scientists say it's essentially equivalent to only being able to see like two pixels wide of your, of your computer. And then they bounce in the water so that they can scan images. And the way that they know how those insects see is they have six little simple eyes on their head. And they kind of took, uh, they took little cameras and they punctured them into their heads. And then they looked through, like, through the back simple eyes to look through the front ones or something like that. It was kind of sad sounding. Um, but yeah, there's, there are some scientists that actually have, like, implanted little cameras into their heads to see, like, to, to see what, how they would see. Um... Yes, that's awesome. Is that he had a problem with his research because they can detect movement so fast. Dragonflies have like a 99% catch rate. And they have the highest percentage catch rate out of any predator out there. So once they target a creature, they have a 99% chance of actually getting the target. Whereas like if you think about a tiger or a lion, those, those mammals are like a closer to 60 or 70% catch rate. So whenever they target something, they've only got like two thirds of a chance of catching it. Where dragonflies have like, a, they pretty much never miss. Um, so that's amazing. 
And they were reacting to the flickering of the computer screen. That's so impressive. All right, so that's a couple of different ways. I also believe that we, we have the ability to train bees. Uh, we can train honeybees to go to certain locations at certain times. We call them time-space locations. And so we can tell, um, and we can teach them colors. So, like, you can say, okay, it's, like, the red flower at this time or, like, the blue flower at this time, and then you can switch them and they'll know which one to go to. So we know that way that they can see color, too. Although it's, uh, I'm not sure of any real, I'm, I haven't read anything about color in flies. I would have to assume it's only very similar. Thank you for asking, Amy. That was an awesome question. All right, so we've got compound eyes. We have these little aristate antenna. We have these little ocelli, um, singular. If you were talking about one of them, it's the ocellus. Uh, I always love the common or the the simple versus um, complex when it's uh, when you when it's different than just adding an s, you know. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna flip over and we're gonna check out this thoracic region. Have they checked that with the with colors outside the human visible spectrum? You mean like is it possible that insects can see colors outside of the humans? The answer would be yes. Many butterflies and bees have the ability to see ultraviolet light, so they can see UV wavelengths. And um, humans don't have the ability to see UV. All right, so with our thoracic region here, I'm actually already pretty happy with, um, with the shape of our thorax, but I do want to kind of solidify it here. Um, if you are looking at the right wing and you're seeing... The clipter is kind of in the way, so I'm trying to um, follow the left side. The right side is um, a little inverted in a way. I'll have to turn it sideways to show you, but this isn't the way it should look. It should look more like this side. All right. So our flies are going to connect their head on almost a little peg into their head. So you can make the connection from the head to the thorax kind of narrow, but then widen it out very quickly. And the... Um, you want the thorax to be wider than the base of the head, but not wider than the compound eyes. All right, so we have the edges of our, of our thorax. I'm going to come in a little bit. I had this as a straight line, but I'm going to arch it just a little bit. Down to this point. And then I'm going to make that solid horizontal line across before we get to the scutellum. This little friendy right here, this little cummerbund guy, is the scutellum. He exists between the thorax and the abdomen. Um, well, I guess he's probably a part of the thorax, but he's right here uh, before you get to the abdomen. And generally, the scutellum can be found in between wings. Uh, flies and beetles and true bugs all have scutellum. I'm sure there are other insects that have scutellum, too, that I'm not thinking of right now. 
Uh, these are flower flies. They do have the ability to pollinate. You'll see that they are covered in small yellow hairs. Um, if you want that scientific name, insect hairs are called CT. And in areas that he is super hairy or fluffy, you can turn that word CT into CTOS, and that means hairy or fluffy, covered in hairs. Susan, that reminds me of actually getting his pet praying mantis. That's awesome, Amy. You know, Disney Animal Kingdom is teaching a jumping spider to catch food at a laser. They're, they're laser point training a jumping spider, and they realize that jumping spiders have a little bit more difficult time seeing the red than seeing, like, a green laser. So when they switched over to training their jumping spiders with a green laser, it worked. So they can get their jumping spiders to come up to a ledge just by shining the laser there because they are expecting food, and it's so cute. Um, so I know that's not an insect, but it's a fun little anecdote. Um, Disney's Animal Kingdom is always doing really cool insect research. Um, why is Disney, Disney doing that? Uh, Disney started that program in their, like, invertebrate house because one of their interns wanted to do it. So it's like one of their, um, it's like one of their newer interns, probably like high school, college student individual, who took on this project and decided to start training their jumping spiders. I'm looking forward to seeing how far it goes. Oh, well, he had very tiny electrodes inserted into their brains. Wow. Are there any insects or bugs that have no hairs? Oh. Are there any insects that have no hair? Sure. Grasshoppers? Grasshoppers are generally not fluffy. They have spines, but they don't really have hair. I would go with grasshoppers as my first thought, although I am sure that there are other insects that don't have hairs that I'm not thinking of. Um... How long does it take to train a jumping spider, and does it remember it consistently, and can other spiders be trained as well? That is, all right, so here's the thing. When you're working with, um, let's get a little sidetracked. I love this. Um, when you're working with animals, especially in zoos and aquariums, uh, you want to encourage natural behaviors along with kind of, what do we call that? It's like giving them toys to have fun and interact, and um, it's like the same reason you see, like, monkeys playing with tires and, like, animals having their food hidden so that they have to reach in and find it. That's called... It has left my memory. But um, that's the idea, is that this thought of, well, we have all of these animals in small enclosures. How do we get them to, like, what if one of them gets sick and we need to help it out? Um, those are things you ha thoughts you have with larger animals. And they're trying to take those thought processes that we have towards larger animals and really focus on the smaller animals and wonder about the husbandry and how can you tell that a jumping spider is happy and how do you, you know, those types of things. They're trying to kind of come up with ways of that, and so they're trying to come up with ways to interact with the jumping spiders. Um, enrichment! That's the word I was looking for. They're looking for enrichment for the tarantulas and the spiders and the like. So, um, oh my goodness, I froze! Um... 
Get on the laser training train. Exactly, but you need a green laser pointer, not a red laser pointer. And I'm sorry about my uh, computer freezing, but in theory, you can st should still be able to hear me. I see my mic um, still is on. So um, I will be back shortly, I promise. I never left. I'm still here. Yes, exactly. Like caring for 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 elephants when they need those types of cares, and um, yeah. So that's what they're that's what they're trying to do. And there's all different uh, there's all different like ways that you can bring enri enrichment to the animals. But they just wanted to see because nobody had ever tried to train a jumping spider to come to a location for food. Right? And so they were just trying to see if they could do it. And they can. And they do remember. And I don't remember how long it took them. I'm thinking it took them months. Um to get the spider actually trained. And they did remember it for their entire lives. Hi, Pi! And Susan mentioned maybe some aquatic insects without hairs. And admittedly, even the aquatic, even a lot of aquatic insects have hair. Because, alright, so there are, for instance, aquatic moths. Um, there are aquatic, I'm pretty happy with the overall shape of my wings, so I'm just outlining my wings right now. Um, there are aquatic moths out there, and those moths are actually covered in hairs. They're covered in hairs that we call... There might be two L's in that word. Um, they're called hydrophilic hairs, and the hydro is water, philic, phobic, sorry, that's why it doesn't look right. They're called hydrophobic hairs, sorry, they're not water-loving hairs, they are water-fearing hairs, meaning that these hairs have the ability to kind of push away water, so the adult moth has the ability to... I'm going to round this. I'm going to round the edge of my wing down just a little bit more. Um, so the hairs, these hydrophobic hairs, actually push water away. And the moth has the ability to dive down into the water and not get wet. Um, because it carries an air bubble with it. And then it can breathe out of that bubble because of diffusion of the oxygen from the water into the bubble. And they will lay their eggs underwater. And a lot of times those caterpillars, when they hatch and they're down in the aquatic system feeding on aquatic plants, they look hairy. But their hairs are actually gills and are the way that these caterpillars can actually breathe underwater. So there are a whole bunch of really awesome insects out there on the planet. I used to have an aquatic caterpillar specimen, but I do not have it anymore. Um, that would have been a whole lot of fun to sketch. All right, so we've got the outline of our wings taken care of. About teaching bees to be comfortable with human activity. That's awesome. So there was a paper that came out, and I and it's a little old now, um, but, I mean, the research is still good, that they actually trained honeybees like six or seven, a large number of time space locations. So they knew, so the bees knew when they were going to get food and they knew where they were going to be getting the food. And they could remember all of these places. And so, um, uh, then the, uh, they taught them in New York. And then they flew these honeybees across the country over to California. And they were curious to see if they were going to be running on New York time based on an internal clock or if they were going to be running on California time based on the angle of the sun. And so 
Um, moral of the story is that the bees got jet lagged. The bees uh, ran on New York time for two or three days and then switched over to California time. Um, which is really kind of funny. So you can teach bees and you can jet lag them. Oh, that's so cool. I love, um, there's some really cool, also interesting research about paper wasps and paper wasps being able to recognize people as, like, friend or foe, um, and I'm curious about that, too, but I haven't read a whole lot about it, so I don't have much knowledge. Need more knowledge to speak on topic. All right, so there are a couple of veins here. There's you can see there are all types of veins happening in here. Something, some things that when I'm looking at an insect wing, there are things that I notice. These veins on the edge, the veins of the wing never reaches the edge of the wing. That's not going to be kind of a, that's not going to be like a defining characteristic or anything. It's not going to help us get to family, but it's always interesting and it's always one of the first things I notice about wing venation because there are some families that, um, that that's going to be one of your big cues. Now, with flower flies in the family Surfidae, the one characteristic that is the same over and over and over and over again is what we call the spurious vein. And you would think that it's this beautiful little wave thing. That is not the spurious vein. Let me go ahead and zoom in, zoom in into it for you because in this specimen, it's a little low. All right, so you see this vein. This vein comes all the way up here. It kind of doubles. It crosses over this vein, right? But then it keeps going, and then it kind of just disappears into nothingness. It doesn't connect to anything. Um, it just kind of disappears. No other flies have a vein like this that just disappears. All right, this is the spurious vein. And if a fly has a spurious vein, it is a flower fly. There are all different colors, all different shapes of flower flies. All you need to do is look at the wing. Now, admittedly, uh, that's a characteristic that you're not going to be able to see while the insect is kind of flying around out there. So if you are out and you are sketching flies uh, that are coming to your flowers, um, you're going to identify the fly based on the antenna, and then a lot of the flower flies are bee mimics. They're black and yellow striped. Not all of them, but many, many of them. And they all have this spurious vein. So I'm going to zoom back out so that we can see the entirety of the wing vein. And I'm just going to walk us through sketching these veins, but I don't have... <coughs> excuse me. Um, I don't have, um, all of the names of these veins all memorized. So, I do know that this top vein here is called the costa. It's nice and dark. It's a leading vein. It's going to be the strongest one. Then you have the sub-costa. That's this dark one that runs parallel at the base. And then... A lot of times when we see a darker spot like this on the wing, that's what we're going to, we're going to call it the stigma. And the subcosta does kind of come and meet the costa here at the end. We have one more vein that kind of comes off of this one. So let's see, right around here at the stigma. It comes around and loops down. Um, then we have one more. And he starts a little higher up. And it's going to arch down to around the stigma. But then once you get there, that's where the cross vein is going to be. So I want to put that in there. Um, and then from here, we're going to come out. We're going to get that really major loopy friend going. And then we're going to come up here. But keep in mind, none of these veins make it to the edge. So we're going to kind of wrap these around a little bit. Uh, 
All right, so um, our next vein is going to start at the base here, and you want it to come reach out and hit right underneath this cross vein and then come down. Now this is where your spurious vein is going to be. So your spurious vein, um, sometimes... In some species, the spurious vein comes out of nowhere and goes to nowhere. Sometimes it looks like this. Like, sometimes it's just a little vein right here that doesn't touch to anything. And when it's like that, it makes me laugh. Because it's like, what was your point? Um, but on this guy, it does seem to connect to this vein and run almost parallel and then kind of disappear. <coughs> All right. Okay. So I've got this vein, these, this wing mostly figured out. I'm going to leave the other side of my sketch without the, uh, without the veins so that I can see more of the abdomen on this side. Um, but you can choose the way you would like. Are there other flies that are bee mimics similar to this that are not flower flies? I can't think of any. There are other flies that are bee mimics. But all hoverflies or flower flies have this type of shape. I could almost say that there's, there might be some type of small robber fly or deer fly that might have this similar color pattern. There may be a robber fly or a deer fly that looks similar. Um... Not robber fly. A uh, deer fly or a, um, a tabanid. There might be tabanids that are bee mimics. Yeah, it would be pretty on stained glass. I would agree. All right, I didn't get that focused right. We're going to turn the specimen so we can see more of the abdomen. We're also going to be turning the specimen to see if we can see the halter. Because why not? Oh, I'm going to tilt the specimen forward a little bit so we're seeing the abdomen... Because it's, uh, the abdomen is tilting away from the microscope a little bit, so if I tilt it this way, we are looking at it from a completely dorsal point of view, kind of picking up the abdomen so that we can see it at the right angle. I can tell a deer fly by its pretty eyes, and by the way, it's biting me. <laughs> That's funny, and yes. There, there may be some species of tabanids that look like bee mimics. Let me look it up. No. Pretty much all of the little flies that go to flowers and they look like bees are flower flies. I mean, I'm sure that there, I'm sure that somebody could find a rule to break it, you know, because insects break all of the rules, even the rules that you think are steadfast and solid, like the fact that all insects have six legs, not a true statement. Um, best beetle grubs only have four, <laughs> but once they become adults, they get six legs. All right, so our first segment of the abdomen is up here, and it's kind of short. Folks, don't read the field guides. That's true. How dare they break our man-made rules? All 
All right. So we're looking at our abdomen here. This first segment is actually kind of kind of short. Um, I'm going to be sketching my abdomen pretty dark on this side, and I'm going to try and keep it pretty light underneath the wing just so that it doesn't um, interfere with all of that beautiful wing venation we just put down. Um, now I'm going to be, we already have a very light outline of what the abdomen's overall shape should be. So what I'm going to be doing is sectioning off our abdomen into pieces. For instance, this first segment is really, really short. And it also is this segment that kind of overlaps with the cummerbund, the scutellum. Now... Um, just like wasps, these flies have those abdomens that the sclerites or the segments kind of overlap one another. So A, what we're going to call A2 is the first one with the yellow coloration on it. We're going to come up, we're going to make it nice and long, and then we're going to cross it over like so. And a lot of times when I'm doing these, the next one is going to be just a little bit inside of that line. And then the next segment is going to end a little bit outside of the line. So you get that, you end up with that kind of siding look. Um, I also really like to add the color spots on these guys because I find them beautiful. But I'm just going to do it on the right side because the left side has the wing. All right, so we've got that taken care of. Maybe I'll do it all the way across. It'll be pretty. Cool. All right, so we've got that one. Now, A3, I always say it looks like a mountain, like a sunrise or a sunset. But I also guess it could look like, you know when water kind of drops and then like buckles up and like makes a little droplet before collapsing back down? It almost looks like that, too. Anyway, so we've got A3 sitting here. So it's going to look a little bit like that, and we have that really pretty kind of mountain with the sun on top of it. And I'm just very lightly leaving some graphite in here to remind myself of where the colors are. Now, after this, I believe these last segments are actually two segments. They just look very um, similar in shape. So we've got one, and then we have two. And then we've got that really pretty kind of yellowy line right here in the center. Right. So we have the head, the thorax, the abdomen. We were able to look at the wings. We were able to look at the spurious vein. Um, let's turn the specimen a little bit. Uh, there's a part of me that really, really wants to add the legs, and there's another part of me that really, really wants to save my voice. So, I am gonna, we're gonna turn off my sketch really quick, and we're just gonna look around at the specimen and see what the legs look like. talk about a thing. So there are a number of different types of flies. And when we're looking at the order, I even believe we call this a suborder. Let me look up and make sure that it is a suborder. It's kind 
of an unranked group. All right, so uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a group. We are looking at a fly that's within the group. We call them the calyptrate flies. And this is a word I haven't shared with you before. So I, uh, I figured, you know, today is the day. We've been looking at a calyptrate fly. And that's because the this fly has... Calypters. I want to make sure that I spelled that right. Yeah. All right. So uh, these flies have calypters. Now, um, calypters are unique to just flies. There's no other insect that has them. And so it's why we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about them. We admittedly have not drawn very many flies. So, <laughs> so, um, Flies do have a front pair of wings, but they don't have a hind pair of wings. They have calypters, and they have haltiers. Now, calypters only some flies have, and haltiers all flies have. So I'm going to start at the haltiers, and we'll work out to the calypters. So right here, you see that there, it looks like there's this little like stalk with a ball at the end of it? That is a haltier, and it's kind of like in the location that the hind wing should be in. If you're looking at like exactly where it's connected and where to the body it's connected, it's kind of like the, uh, the fly lost a hind wing and gained a haltier. Now you may ask, what in the world is a haltier and why do they need them instead of having wings? Now, I'm talking to adults now, you may know what a gyroscope is. So the haltiers are going to help the fly balance in the air. So just like a just like a plane has a gyroscope to make sure that they have the ability to stay level in the air, flies have haltiers to make sure that they stay level. It also helps them zoom around all over the place like crazy insects. So if you've ever tried to catch a fly, you will have had that experience. Now, um, the calypters only some flies have, and these are like little pads that generally cover the haltiers so you can't see them. I think that this specimen, I can see the haltiers just because his calyptor is moved out of the way. It's right here. It looks like a little flap of wing, um, but it's not a piece of the wing. It's actually on its body. I can show you on this side, the calyptor is more is like in the way so I wasn't able to show you the haltier on this side let's see it's just really hard to see the calyptor generally is going to be hiding underneath the wing, so you can almost see it. It's a really light disc. It exists right around here, and it's covering the haltier. So um, the calyptrate flies are the flies with calyptors, and those flies are flower flies, house flies, muscids, uh, deer flies, uh, golden dung flies. There is a large group of them. Um, flies that are not calypterate, yeah, not calypterate flies, we call them acalypterate, meaning that they don't have calypters. Uh, he's got a funny face shape. Okay. He's got a sheath that protects his mouth, and his mouth is going to be used to drink nectar. So you can see that the sheath is kind of pulled up right now. It's right here. There's this little sheath that's kind of pulled up, and this pointy thing, that's the way that, it she that this fly is going to drink nectar. 
then this back here is the sheath that protects it. Let's see. Up here somewhere. All right, so um, personally, I'm not really feeling too up to sketching the legs. Um, I hope you're not going to be too upset about that. I can show off the legs a little bit. Deb says that I need to take care of myself. And so that's why I'm thinking that this is a beautiful fly. And we had a wonderful day. <coughs> All right. So I hope that everybody has had a wonderful day. Um, and that you've learned a little bit about flies. If we can get some clear, good clear shots of the legs, we can always pause and sketch later. True enough. So let me go ahead and give you some nice um, images of some of these legs. So this is a front leg. Uh, this is the femur. This is the tibia. And these are the tarsal segments. You can see down here, this is the bottom of the tarsal segments on the other side. You have the tarsal claws here. And then you have the toe pads that I believe are called the pulvoli, but that might be the hair in between the toes. These are little toe pads. Yeah, they have cute little Darcy. So this is the hind leg. The middle leg and the front legs are very, very similar. But the hind leg, this is the femur here. This is the coxy, but you can't see that from the top. This is the femur. The tibia comes back in this direction, and the tarsal segments are right here. The femur here is kind of wide. It's nice and expanded. Um, and I was trying to get a good image of all of them, but let's go ahead and zoom in at the toes for a minute. So these are your tarsal segments, and the femur is really easily viewed from the other side. And that is the femur and the tibia of the hind leg. Or, if you wanted to get really fancy, this is the metafemur and the metatibia because they're on the last leg. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
I hope that you've had a wonderful day today. I absolutely love doing this, which is absolutely why I do this with a little bit of a cough and a sore throat, because it's absolutely what I love, and it makes my night and my week, and I think about sketching with you and deciding what I'm going to sketch, and admittedly, we're running out of bugs, so I need spring to come faster so that I can collect more buggies for us. Um, this is my sketch from today. It's pretty simple, but I'm pretty happy with the veins and things, and you know, we're good. So there's our, there's our cute little flower fly for the day. Um, I have had a handful of personal things going on in my life, so I have not been able to send out your gifts yet, but I did get all of the packaging together and stuff, so now all I have to do is actually write the labels and take them to the post office. We are getting there. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have not, um, there were a number of you who already have given me your addresses so that I can send you my thank you for... So, um, thank you for donating to me present. I have presents for those of you who would like them who have donated to me. So if you have donated to me and um, through this PayPal link, uh, you can always go and email me at Trisha at theinsectopia.com and I will mail you a present and a thank you letter because I really, really appreciate all of you. And um, you can send me your address, your address to directly to my email at trisha at theinsectopia dot com. That's my email address. Um, and I will be sending those out shortly. I'm really excited. Um, these, uh, this is out school. I teach on teach for ages. 5 to 8, 9 to 12. I actually have a college prep kind of high school level class starting next Tuesday. Um, that's for ages 13 to 17. So if you know a teenager in your life who is really interested in insects, this is an eight week two months just a college prep where we talk about all of the antenna and all of the legs and all of the wing types and we go over each little part and then we break down all of the orders. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can find the links on OutSchool and my OutSchool links are in the box below. If you follow my link below and you've never had an OutSchool class before, then OutSchool will give you $20 to take any classes you want and they don't even have to be my classes but you can always go down there and use the link now that up there is the what is your reminder to subscribe to the youtube channel thank you all very much for chatting with me in the chat box i know all of you are subscribed and i really appreciate you now this is your qr code that directs you directly to my paypal if you would like to send me a couple of dollars you like to donate um, it's always super duper appreciated and it helps me keep up with my collecting supplies and my pinning supplies and my microscope time and all of those types of things, making sure that when my light bulbs go out on my microscope, I can replace them. <laughs> um, so those are all very appreciated. And I do have a, uh, I do have an, um, Instagram, and if you wanted to check it out, it's at Insectopia2015, that's the year that I was, that I established the name Insectopia, so it's the year that ends up, ended up on a couple of my tags. So if you were, um, looking for me on, ins on Instagram or Facebook, I'm at Insectopia2015. Alright, so... I have a good number of your addresses, but if you haven't sent it to me yet, please do so, because those presents are coming out hopefully within the week. Looking forward to it. Okay, have a wonderful rest of your week. I live stream next on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern, and then next Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, and I will have a voice by then. I'm sure of it. <laughs> If I don't have a voice by Sunday, I might cancel the live stream because I don't really want to keep pushing myself if I, if, um, especially on Sundays. I, I, uh, I, I prefer, I don't prefer, but like my Thursday classes are generally be well, more like better attended. And so, um, these are the ones I'd never, ever want to miss every now and again. I miss a Sunday. So hopefully I'm feeling better, and if not, we might be skipping the Sunday session. I will post on YouTube if I'm canceling it, though. 
All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. I'm going to go and drink some tea. All right. Stay buggy. Bye.